Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture of 6838. Now today we're going to continue our discussion of basically one-dimensional geometry, but rather than just talking about smooth objects, in today's lecture we're going to explore what it takes to adapt that smooth theory to a discrete structure. In our case, we're just going to worry about chains of line segments. Before we get started, I should note that a large part of today's lecture is inspired by an old SIGGRAPH course on discrete differential geometry. I'll try to link those in the course notes and maybe the YouTube video uh, if I remember. So if you recall from our last lecture, we essentially derived an entire theory of discrete curves both in two and three dimensions. So for example, in two dimensions, we defined the tangent and normal of a smooth curve and we showed that those are vectors that are associated with points along the curve rather than with associated to the parametrization of the curve. So even if I have a parametrization that like drives along the curve at double speed, the tangent and normal vectors are the same. Moreover, by differentiating the tangent with respect to arc length, we found that we got the curvature weighted normal, this function kappa of s, which is essentially telling us how quickly the curve is bending as a function of arc length. We also explored kind of a similar theory in 3D, um, and we showed a few other invariants that we can derive from a curve. So for instance, we defined the winding number of a curve when it's closed, which is an integer saying how many times the curve loops around itself. This only works in the plane, by the way. In 3D, uh, k or kappa is no longer unsigned, or rather is no longer signed, and then the winding number is a little trickier to define. In fact, it's arguably impossible to define in dimension bigger than two without a lot of work and kind of drawing a lot of pictures to explain what you mean. Now in 3D, we also defined curvature and torsion, and this is because we now have a frame that is composed of three different vectors, the tangent, the normal, and then a third vector called the binormal. And essentially the curvature is kind of like the amount that the curve bends in its own plane, and then the torsion is the amount that the curve is lifting out of its current plane of motion. So these are all nice calculations, and they're calculations that you probably encounter in the math department here at MIT, but the real question that we're after in the computer science area is what do these calculations look like in software? So if my input data is a discrete curve, this actually happens sometimes, for example, in computer graphics domain, can I approximate quantities like curvature and torsion in a reasonable fashion? Now, these are questions that have been around a long time, and there's no single answer. There's many different techniques for discretizing curvature and torsion and tangents and normals and binormals that all make sense for different applications. Remember that we have this no free lunch property, which sort of leads us to this proliferation of different ways that we can discretize many of the interesting quantities that we encounter in geometry when we start doing it computationally. Now, if you took my 6837 undergrad computer graphics course, most of our curves look something like what you see in the figure here. This is a Bezier curve with four control points, and we had piecewise smooth approximations of curves that were typically built out of like little segments that maybe were cubic functions of t. And that was useful for artistic applications uh, because it meant that with just a few control points, an artist could specify a pretty smooth curve. But now in the shape analysis course, we're less interested in designing curves, at least for now, and more interested in analyzing them, and this is not a particularly convenient representation in this application. In particular, let's say this object really is a cubic Bezier curve, meaning that the x, y, and z uh, coordinate functions are cubic functions of t. Then there's a very simple question you might ask, trying to adapt our theory from the last lecture to today's context, which is, what is the arc length of a cubic Bezier curve? So remember that we have this nice arc length integral on the bottom of the uh, slide here. Uh, well, we could easily plug in a cubic function for gamma and just see what happens. And unfortunately, at least to my knowledge, it's not known in closed form. There's no formula in terms of the control points of our curve that give it its length. Now, that's not to say we can't invent all kinds of numerical methods for approximating the length of a cubic Bezier curve, but it means that even if we're using these cubic Bezier curves because they're somehow nice representations, we're not going to have access to the arc length as an exact number. It's still going to be an approximation. So 
This is a sad fact that's true across a lot of geometric representations that you see in computer-aided design that typically are built out of splines or piecewise polynomials and so on, that very rarely do close-form expressions for things like uh, arc length exist. And when they do exist, for example, you can compute the curvature of a cubic curve, they're typically really messy. And so for shape analysis, this representation is not particularly useful. And instead, maybe we just tessellate our curve with something simpler, like a bunch of line segments. And initially that feels kind of dirty, but the reality is that even though we like Bezier curves for computer graphics applications, the set of Bezier curves is still a lot smaller than the set of all possible curves in 3D or 2D or whatever. These are all just approximations. And so instead, in this class, we're going to work with much simpler objects. So today, we're going to think of curves on the computer as just polylines. Now, what is a polyline? It's a piecewise linear representation of a curve, meaning that it's just a sequence of points connected by line segments. That's it. And our task today is going to be to define notions like curvature, arc length, and so on, based on just having this long chain of points. Now, Arc length is the one easy one we can all agree on, right? The arc length of this polyline is just the sum of the lengths of the line segments. But when we start talking about differential structures, then we start getting into trouble. In particular, take a look here. So here I've shown you a polyline curve. And maybe I go back to the formulas from our previous lecture and compute the honest to goodness curvature of this polyline curve, forgetting that it's not differentiable. Well, what do I get? along each of the line segments in our polyline, the curvature is zero, right? Straight lines are flat. There's nothing interesting going on there. And then at every vertex, well, suddenly psh, the curve turns this delta amount, so the curvature is infinity. So is that it? Is that the curvature of a polyline curve? All I can say is that it's zero, 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 zero infinity, zero, 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 zero. Well, that's not a very particularly, particularly useful takeaway for computation. So we're going to try and dig farther and farther in. Now, today we're going to mostly explore a perspective from the discrete differential geometry community. But before we do that, of course, we should call out a different approach that would be more typical in numerical analysis. In particular, remember that there's a technique called finite differences. Essentially, the idea here is that if I want to approximate the derivative of a function, one thing that I can do is forget that it's a limit as h goes to zero and plug in the limiting expression, like the right-hand side of the uh, squiggly equals sign here. So this is a very classical thing to do in numerical analysis, and typically what it leads to are lots of theorems that fit into the kind of template that I give on the slide here, right? That as h goes to zero, some fact becomes true, like you know, our approximation gets closer and closer to the true derivative of our function. Right? So for instance, maybe if our polyline here is a really dense sampling of a smooth curve, we could follow this finite difference approach and come up with some reasonable notions of curvature. Now this is great, but we're very unlikely to get that nice structure preservation that we mentioned all the way back in lecture one. So that curvature, this sort of approximated quantity is very unlikely to satisfy any of the useful theorems that we know and love from the theory of differential geometry. Moreover, a lot of times we don't have access to densely sampled data. I wish this were the case, but it's just often not, right? So many times when we have curves, all we're given as input is a long chain of sample points, and we can't go back and ask our user for more. That's just this chain of data that we were given. So in other words, our reality check here is that in almost all computational settings, especially in the shape analysis universe, with the exception of maybe computer-aided design, h is a finite positive value. We can't just take a limit as h goes to zero. And so this is going to motivate us to come up with alternative definitions of curvature that just naturally make sense for a piecewise linear curve. Now, this is a fabulous example of the kind of mindset that I, I mentioned in lecture one. We're going to have to kind of simultaneously have two different frames of mind going on at the same time. On the one hand, when we come up with notions of curvature on discrete curves, we probably do want that like theory of convergence to hold. That is, you know, if I define the discrete curvature of some chain of line segments, and now I take that chain of line segments and I just more and more finely sample some smooth curve, I kind of expect my discrete curvature to 
converge to the smooth one or else why am I, what business do I have using the word curvature? But on the other hand, the kind of more modern thing to think about is that I also want some notion of curvature that does something interesting before h goes to zero. See if I can preserve structure or be able to prove something about my discrete notion of curvature rather than just approximate properties. So our goal today is to examine discrete theories of differentiable curves. Again, this sounds like a total contradiction in terms, you know. Uh, we shouldn't be able to have discrete theories of derivatives, and yet we'll be able to see that by designing curvature and other notions very carefully, we can come up with kind of analogs of the computations we did in our previous lecture that still preserve some of the nice smooth global structure that we derived uh, when we were talking about smooth curves. Okay, notice, by the way, that IES, that I just put an underline underneath, that essentially, because of this no free lunch property that I kind of called out before, what we're gonna see is that there are many different options for making smooth curvature work on a discrete object, and all of them are kind of reasonable approximations of smooth curvature. In fact, all of them are convergent. We'll kind of motivate that. We're not gonna prove it carefully, but we'll motivate it. But they all look different discreetly. And so this is where we're kind of halfway between engineering and mathematics, right? We have to choose a discrete theory of curvature that satisfies what we want in the discrete regime because we can't have one definition of discrete curvature that has all the properties that smooth curvature can have. We'll see that in just a few minutes here. So as a little bit of review, let's uh, remember our signed curvature definition for plane curves. So what did we do? We parametrized our curve by arc length, which meant that the tangent vector of our curve is now a unit vector. Unit vectors in the plane necessarily can be written as cosine theta, sine theta. So when we differentiated our unit tangent vector in arc length, we got this expression down here, which gave us the curvature weighted normal of the curve. In addition to that, we very quickly defined an object, which I've uh, kind of mentioned on the slide, which is the Gauss map of a curve. So in two dimensions, this is the map from points on the curve into the unit circle, and the map is just given by the normal vector to the curve. So the point on the unit circle is the, norm the normal vector to the curve. And remember that by integrating uh, the curvature of a closed curve, we're able to derive a particular number called the turning number or winding number of a curve, which just describes the number of times it loops around itself. Um, one way to understand that is remember that curvature is the derivative of this angle theta, and so if a curve loops back on itself, then theta necessarily is some multiple of two pi, right? That's the only way to make the tangent kind of align from beginning to end. And the multiple of two pi that you get is the turning number. So some examples of turning numbers are shown uh, here. This is a nice topological property of curves. Uh, and so for example, a curve with zero turning number, like all the way on the right, is one that never makes a loop all the way around the black circle. The turning number of two means it loops twice and so on. So one question we might ask is, can we come up with some definition of discrete curvature on a polyline that conserves this turning number theorem in some sense? Now, initially this sounds a little crazy, but what we're gonna find is that there's actually a nice intuition that will lead us to a construction with exactly this property. And moreover, it's actually just an application of high school level geometry. Uh, just refashioned a tiny bit. So here's how we're going to do it. First of all, we can think about there being a discrete Gauss map associated to a uh, polyline curve, and it's kind of illustrated like what you see on the slide here. So the discrete Gauss map is kind of a weird object, but it's going to start giving us an intuition for this primal dual relationship that's so critically important in the discrete differential geometry world. In particular, Remember that the normal vector to a straight line, this is a constant, right? That's what we're seeing in each of these line segments here. And now the question is, what happens to the normal vector at every vertex? Well, in some sense, it's kind of illustrated in gray here. When I get to a vertex, I can think of the normal vector as kind of sweeping out some arc on the circle and then moving on to the next constant along the next segment. So this gives us a really interesting notion of a discrete Gauss map. In particular, in our discrete Gauss map, the edges of the polyline 
become points in the discrete Gauss map because the normal is constant along the entire edge. And the vertices of our uh, polyline become entire arcs on the discrete Gauss map. This is our very first example of a primal dual structure where somehow we've swapped the roles of the vertices and the arcs. Do you see that? So the vertices and the arcs on the uh, polyline become arcs and vertices on the discrete uh, Gauss map. It's kind of a fun construction and a little bit suggestive of what we're going to do on triangle meshes in a couple weeks. Okay, so now I'm going to remind you of a theorem that you almost certainly proved in a high school geometry class and didn't appreciate it for the cool theorem that it is. And that's something called the exterior angle theorem. So let's say that I take a closed polyline. So in other words, just a chain of vertices that forms a loop where the last vertex and the first one are the same. Then I can define exterior angles as the turning angle of my uh, curve at every vertex. That's like theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and so on, as uh, illustrated in our figure here. Now here is the kind of I don't know if you want to call it an observation or a convenient fact that you might remember from high school. But there's a really useful theorem, which is that the sum of the exterior angles in a closed polygon is exactly 2 pi. And in fact, if I allow my closed polygon to loop over itself multiple times, then it's actually 2 pi times the number of times that it loops over itself. Now here I'm thinking of uh, these thetas as being signed. You can see that they're going in um, the clockwise direction. So if I go in the reverse, then I'm going to think of k as, as flipping sign, S-I-G-N. Um, but the basic point here is that I have this useful classical theorem from high school geometry, which is that if I sum up the exterior angles on a polygon, I get 2 pi times the number of times the polygon loops over itself. Again, this is the exterior angle theorem. But it looks an awful lot like the winding number, right? Remember the winding number theorem? Um, is telling us, uh, can I find it? This was a mistake. <laughs> Our definition of winding number uh, was that when we sum up curvature, we get some number, which is the number of times that a loop, a curve loops around itself. Similarly here, we have some measurement that looks like a bunch of angles being summed together, that when I do sum them together, I get the number of times that the curve loops around itself. So what's going on here? In some sense, we can think of that turning angle theta as an integrated amount of curvature in a dual cell associated to that vertex. What does that mean? Well, I can define something called a dual cell gamma, which is like the pair of half line segments <laughs> that are closest to a particular vertex, like what you see in this figure then in some sense that turning angle theta is the total amount that the curve changes its tangent or its normal direction from one end of that Voronoi cell to the other. So it's kind of like the integral of curvature. Notice that the curvature itself is like kind of this weird quantity, right? It's like this little delta function sitting at a vertex. That's hard to think about. But the integrated curvature from one end to the other end of this little cell in parentheses we have on the slide is that nice angle theta. That's actually a number that we can work with. So if we wanted to approximate curvature, then one way that we might do it is to take the total length, like the sum of those two half line segments on either side of the vertex, take theta and just divide it by that sum. That's the expression that we see on the right. This is some approximation of curvature. Why is that? Well, if you look at the integral on the left-hand side, right, if we want curvature, well, one way to get rid of an integral sign is to differentiate. <laughs> and so this is some divided difference approximation of curvature based on the formula on the left-hand side. So notice that there's an equal sign on the left and a squiggly equal sign on the right. <laughs> and I think that kind of intuitively makes sense, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we have two line segments. There's no like smooth curve. So talking about pointwise curvature doesn't make any sense. But the kind of interesting thing is that we can work with integrated quantities, like this value theta, which is the integral of kappa over these two line segments. Now, this has some kind of interesting geometric observations that we should think about for a few minutes here. So in particular, take a look. 
So here I'm showing you two different polylines. I've basically taken the first one and then subdivided it to obtain the second one. But other than that, they're exactly the same. And they both meet at the same angle theta. But if we go back to our approximation, kappa, remember that kappa is divided by the cell uh, size, like the sum of the two L's. So what does that lead us to C? Well, essentially, kappa 1 is going to be divided by a bigger number than kappa 2, right? Because kappa 2 has a little itty-bitty dual cell. So in other words, kappa 1 is much less than kappa 2. But they, have, they share the same angle. Now, intuitively, that seems a little weird because these two curves are identical. But if I kind of add these little curves that fill in this space, I think this suggestive picture kind of shows you what's going on. That essentially, by adding information to my polyline to go from left to right, I've now suggested that my curve actually has a much sharper crease than I might have observed on the left-hand side. OK. So again, to just tell you a little bit of the terminology that really matters here, the basic point is that the thing we can measure with an equal sign, the thing we're confident in measuring, is not the curvature. It's not a differential quantity. But it's the integral of curvature along this pair of line segments. And that's this value theta. And this is giving us the total change in curvature throughout the dual cell. OK. Moreover, remember that we were interested in talking about conserved structures and take a look. Well, now I claim that we have the world's simplest discrete turning angle theorem that is a conserved structure from the smooth turning angle theorem that we had before. How do I get that? Well. What is the integral of curvature, like on the left-hand side? Well, the integral of curvature on our entire closed loop is nothing more than the sum of the integrals of the curvature on each of the dual cells gamma i, as illustrated on our slide here. By definition, the integral along uh, each gamma i of curvature is theta i. That's the second equal sign here. And now I can apply the discrete, you know, just the exterior angle theorem to get 2 pi k. So what did I do here? <laughs> this is kind of like just a mathematical sleight of hand. I mean, I mean this, you know, calling this a theorem is a little bit lame. <laughs> but essentially, what I did is I made a choice of how I'm going to define curvature. In fact, I didn't even define curvature. I just defined an integrated curvature along a pair of line segments. And I made that choice specifically for the reason that, well, now if I integrate that notion of curvature along my discrete curve, I get 2 pi k, which is exactly the same as the winding number theorem that I had for smooth curvature. So there's some conserved structure. Notice that there's no squiggly equal sign here. This is 100% this is true. Now, in our little extra le uh, lecture segment that I'll post on YouTube, we're also going to show that uh, there's a first variation formula that if I take a curve and I flow it along its curvature normal, um, then I actually am kind of doing gradient descent on arc length. And one thing that I can do is, well, I could differentiate the length of a polyline in the positions of its vertices and get some kind of vector field-like object and try to define curvature that way. And sadly, what we're going to find, this is actually on your homework, is that you don't quite get what you hope for. <laughs> uh, in particular, remember that we just defined discrete curvature to be theta i. But if I take the derivative of arc length, I get a different discrete curvature. Remember that I should get the curvature weighted normal. Here we have the normal, but the weight in front of it is sine of theta i. <laughs> so this is our first example of a no-free lunch scenario. I can either have curvature that preserves this first variation of arc length property, or I can have curvature that preserves the winding number theorem, but I can't have them both. I got to choose one. Now, that's the discrete perspective. We should also talk about the discretization perspective. In fact, OK, so we have two notions of curvature. One is theta i, integrated curvature. One is theta i, and the other is sine of theta i over 2 multiplied by 2. Well, for really, really small thetas, I can plug in the Taylor series for sine, and I'll find that they are basically the same. So what does that mean? That means if I densely sample my curve, these two different discrete notions of curvature will converge to the same value. So they're both similarly behaved in the limit. In fact, they're both convergent under some assumptions. But they disagree in the discrete regime. 
And so if you want a structure-preserving notion of curvature, you have to decide which structure you want. You can either have a discrete turning angle theorem, or you can say that my curvature comes from the gradient of arc length, but not both. Tina Fey here is not happy. Um, one remaining question is, does discrete curvature converge in the limit? We're going to omit the proof of that in this class, but my answer is yes, under some assumptions that we're not going to state here. Um, Proving convergence is something that we often are quite sloppy about in the applied world, and it's really tricky to do. I mean, well, if you call a proof just trying it a bunch of times and making sure it agrees with ground truth, that's one thing. But, but actually proving theoretically, um, you have to decide what kind of convergence you care about, like pointwise versus uniform. You have to be careful about how you sample your curve. So like, do I need a uniformly dense sampling of a smooth curve? Is it okay if some samples are more densely sampled than others and so on? I may also have to put some assumptions on the smoothness of my curve or that it has bounded curvature or something like that. This stuff gets really hairy really fast, so I'm going to refer you to a more classical numerical analysis class if you like that kind of a topic. Okay, so this is sort of what's motivating our discrete differential geometry universe. We end up with measurements of some smooth quantity that we're trying to adapt to a discrete structure like a polyline. And when we do, we end up seeing different discrete behavior for different structures that we try to preserve, but all of them converge to the same value, at least if we're lucky. This is really fun. <laughs> what does it mean? It means that there's like this whole zoo of geometric measurements that we could do for every single simple geometric measurement that we did in the classical case. Okay, so everything we've done so far in today's lecture was for discrete plane curves. Now, the next thing that we might ask about are curves in 3D, like these artist-generated ones that I found on the internet and I thought were kind of cool. <laughs> so now we could ask questions like, can we come up with a discrete Frenet frame that preserves some structures from the smooth case? Recall that the Frenet frame is this trio of vectors associated with points along a curve that satisfy this differential equation here, where kappa is the curvature, t is the unit tangent, and tau is the uh, torsion, and b is the binormal. And in fact, one thing that you'll find if you search online for discrete Frenet frames, in fact, you know, this isn't really my area of expertise, so I spent a little bit of time digging around and what you find is that there actually isn't much. <laughs> um, there are some kind of divided different style approaches to computing discrete Frenet frames, but there actually aren't that many applications that benefit from it. There are a few. So for example, in, uh, I believe this is what, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging um, for doing kind of, uh, 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 trying to determine structures of proteins and so on. Maybe some proteins you can model as like, atoms linked together with straight lines, you'll notice that your instructor is definitely not a chemist or a biologist. Um, and so some folks have determined different ways that you might try to measure a discrete Frenet frame on a structure like this. And I encourage you to dig through these papers because they're kind of interesting attempts to make the smooth theory work in the discrete regime. So for example, in this um, uh, paper that's kind of drawn from applied physics, uh, here's a kind of reasonable discretization of a Frenet frame. So if you take a look here, the PJs are the different points along our polyline. So the tangent, the unit tangent, is associated to every line segment, right? So it's, uh, let's see here, if I want to draw a bunch of segments along my polyline, like that, then maybe I have P1, P2, P3, P4, then essentially what these folks do is they say, okay, well, I can really clearly compute tangent vectors along the edges of my uh, polyline here. And I'm gonna do that by just taking this edge and dividing it by its length, right? So we call this, uh, let's see here, this is j plus one, so it'll be t1, t2, t3. And now, well, okay, so things get a little bit trickier uh, for defining the binormal and the normal, but you can actually do it, and it's a, a pretty reasonable thing. So, for instance, to get this binormal vector b, remember that the binormal is pointing out of the plane of motion of your uh, curve? So here, for example, conveniently, I have a, a flat blackboard in front of me, so our curve here is flat. So if I want the binormal, it's probably going to be perpendicular. For example, if I place the binormal at the point p, then it should be perpendicular to both 
the incoming and the outgoing tangent vectors because those kind of form a plane at the point P. Right? So, for instance, uh, in this discretization, they define the binormal at vertex J to be the cross product between the previous tangent vector and the next tangent vector. And, well, what do you do? Well, you get the normal vector uh, by just taking another cross product because we know that the normal, the binormal, and the normal all have to be, sorry, the tangent, the binormal, and the normal all have to be mutually orthogonal. Notice that that normal vector is a little fishy, right? Because the, uh, the binormal, right? Like, for example, the binormal here is B2 and B3, right? So B2 would be the cross product of T1 and T2, right? That's what the second formula is saying. That sort of makes sense, right? It's out of the plane of the board here. But then the way that we define the normal vector is a little fishy, right? Because it's the cross product of BJ, so like B2, and TJ, T2. So it's no longer symmetric, right? Like it's using the tangent vector pointing to the right. It could have just as easily used the one pointing to the left. So I think in this discretization, personally, I kind of trust the T and the B, but I don't necessarily trace, trust the N quite as much. In any event, um, by looking at the angles between these different successive vectors, you can also come up with some kind of integrated notion of curvature and torsion. I'm going to refer you guys to this paper uh, for, for a little bit more details. Um, in fact, uh, in this kind of work, uh, you can actually come up with entire what they call transfer matrices for moving frames along discrete curves, which are pretty fun objects to work with. So let's uh, give this a quick erase. All right. So if you dig in a little bit, you'll actually find that there's a lot of challenges with the Fresnay frame that maybe prevent a lot of applications from working well. And this was observed in a paper that we're going to go over in just a few minutes on uh, discrete elastic rods. But one of the main challenges with the Fresnay frame, and this actually dates back before discrete differential geometry was a thing, um, um, back to a mathematician by the name of Bishop, is that the Fresnay frame can be ill-defined, right? In particular, uh, when kappa equals zero, we'll see that our entire derivation of the Fresnay frame in 3D kind of falls apart. Um, and so what does that mean? That means along straight line segments, it's kind of impossible to distinguish between the normal and the binormal. The tangent is still well-defined, but the normal and the binormal can kind of be anything. You need curvature to make the normal work, because remember the normal is the derivative of the unit tangent vector, but if the unit tangent vector is a constant, like along a straight line, then the derivative of the unit tangent is zero, so I don't have a well-defined normal direction anymore. Moreover, Sometimes keeping track of line segments is not enough. So we're going to talk a little bit and summarize just at a high level the contents of a SIGGRAPH 2008 paper that I thought is really fun. This is a really nice paper to read, and I encourage you all to pause this video, download the paper, and just appreciate it for how beautiful it is. This is work on discrete elastic rods. This is by uh, Bergu, Vardesky, Robinson, Audouli, and Greenspun. I'm sure that I'm pronouncing most of these folks' names incorrectly. But... The basic purpose of this research paper was to come up with a theory of framed curves that works on discrete objects and was suitable for simulating elastic rods. So elastic rods are things like shoelaces or spaghetti or whatever, you know, basically one-dimensional objects, but they actually have kind of a complicated geometry. And that's illustrated in this figure here. Now, if I take a piece of string and I start to take one of the ends and twist it, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens that's shown in this animation. All the animations and figures in this part of our lecture are due to that research paper. So that these interesting objects start to show up in the middle of our curve. I believe this is called a plectoneme. And essentially, this is a byproduct not just of the curve, but of the twisting that you see at the end of the curve. Now, our notion of framed curves is not quite enough to keep track of that information, right? Like, so for example, if I have just a straight line and I twist the ends of that straight line, it remains straight, but now the material of my uh, object has this kind of corkscrew structure that's hiding inside of it. Now, there are different ways that I could go about discretizing that. I mean, one of them would be to say, okay, well, maybe the issue is that it's not really a one-dimensional object anymore. Right? Maybe I should be simulating like a really long and thin cylinder that I can then twist about its axis, but somehow that feels like overkill. So instead, 
What these folks chose to work with was framed curves. Now, a framed curve, the idea here is that it's not just a curve in 3D, but it's a curve where I've attached along the curve a frame of two orthogonal directions that are both perpendicular to the tangent of our curve. So for example, you see this orange and blue coloring along the curve, which is trying to kind of illustrate twist. Um, that's essentially what's going on here, is that there's this material frame, M1 comma M2, which is trying to capture how this material is twisted as I move along the curve, right? So if I take, for example, you know, my relaxed piece of string and I start twisting the ends, then what I'm going to get is a material frame that spins along my straight line. Okay, and so this is an adapted framed curve where the frame, unlike the Fresnay frame, is sort of meaningful for a physical problem. I think this is a really cool idea. So it turns out that the physics of framed, of adapted frame curves is an interesting physics, and we can measure a lot of different things, right? So for example, one of these curves might try and resist bending and want to go back to a straight line. Um, we could define a bending energy, which takes in a curve and tells you about how bent it is by writing down this integral here. This is a pretty straightforward integral, uh, which is just the integral of curvature squared. So if I have a straight line curve, my bending energy is zero. And as I take my curve and I start bending it, then what I get, of course, is uh, you know, a higher and higher value of the bending energy. And then the physics is going to want to reduce that bending energy over time, right? This is like the uh, Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian in the mechanical uh, formulation. Now, what's gonna go on in this paper is that rather than working with the Fresnay frame, they're gonna work with other frames, which are the tangent and then these two material directions along the curve. So shown on the bottom of the slide is going to be some derivation for getting an alternative formula for this bending energy. So what can I do? Well, I start with the curvature weighted normal. That's what's shown on the left of the equal sign. Of course, that's equal to t prime by definition. And remember that I can take any vector and write it in an orthonormal basis, right? The t m1 and m2 basis, as shown on the second line here. So what do I do? I take t prime, and I can write it in the t m1 m2 orthonormal basis, just by taking dot products. Well, remember that t is a unit vector, so t prime dot t is equal to zero. That leads us to our third line here. And we're just going to make a definition of omega 1 and omega 2, which are the component of the rate of change of the unit tangent in the m1 and m2 directions. Remember, again, what is the rate of change of the unit tangent? It's just kappa n, right? So this is the components of the curvature weighted normal in the m1, m2 directions. We'll call those omega 1 and omega 2. And essentially, what this little proof shows us is that I can write our bending energy just in terms of the omegas, which is going to be convenient when we do our physical dynamics, uh, because those are going to be the things that are kind of changing in, over time. So this is like penalizing turning the steering wheel or the twist as I, or, or the, the, the bending as I move along the curve. Now, in addition to that, I also probably want to penalize or punish non-tangent chains in the material frame itself, right? So if I have a string and I start twisting it like that, then the string is going to want to untwist. So how can I measure that? Well, remember that I have this material frame, which is kind of like how the material is twisting as I move along the curve. Right, so again, the picture that I should have in mind here is that I have some framed curve, and then along my framed curve, there are some orthogonal directions. I can never draw this correctly. So these are meeting at 90 degrees, like M1 and M2. And these are sort of spiraling over a curve if our curve is twisted over itself a bunch of times. Well, M1 and M2 are unit vectors. So remember what that means. That means that M 1 dot m1 prime is equal to 0 because the norm of m1 is equal to 1. Sorry, should be ah, 2 here. Uh, and similarly uh, for m2, right? So m2 dot m2 prime is equal to 0 for the same reason. OK. So if we want to know how our frame is twisting along the curve, we can look at the rate of change of the uh, 
material directions like m1 and m2 along the curve and then take the component parallel to the other guy, <laughs> right? Because this is like the amount of corkscrew motion that we see in the m1, m2 frame as it kind of moves along our curve. And of course, thanks to actually the proposition that we proved in our previous lecture, uh, we can write this twist value m in two different ways shown on the bottom of the slide. But in either case, we define our twisting energy as seen here. Let me erase real quick. Okay. So, so far we've defined an interesting frame for a curve, right, which is essentially a triplet of directions. There's the tangent to the curve, and then m1 and m2, which are kind of describing the physical configuration. It's not just a product of the geometry anymore. The m1 and m2 are carrying additional information, which is the twist of our object along its axis. But now there's another question we have to ask, which is, what frame should we use to store the M1 and M2 frames? <laughs> this feels complicated, but essentially I told you that the Fernet frame isn't terribly helpful, but I still need some frame that's oriented or aligned to my curve that I can use as a function of just the geometry rather than the geometry and the physics together that I can use to represent M1 and M2. And fortunately, a sort of hipster frame uh, that we can also place along curves come to the rescue. And this is a different frame that's far less known, but still equally cool to the Fournier frame called the Bishop frame. It comes from a paper with an only mildly snarky title called There is More Than One Way to Frame a Curve by Richard Bishop. And this is actually some version of parallel transport, which is going to be a notion that we'll talk about when we discuss vector fields, just restricted to this very simple case of curves uh, sitting in R3. And there are many nice properties of the Bishop frame um, that are not true for the Fernet frame. But probably the most important one is that the Bishop frame is well defined for straight lines. <laughs> so here's how we define the Bishop frame. And I encourage you to read this discrete elastic rods paper for details. But essentially the Bishop frame is defined via an ODE, an ordinary differential equation. So what we do is we specify some frame of our curve at a single point, and that frame consists of a tangent vector. It's always the tangent vector. That's like the one direction we can all agree on. And then two other actually arbitrarily chosen directions, u comma v. And then what we do is we solve for the version of u comma v that is always tangent, or, or rather always perpendicular to t, and twists the least amount in terms of that twisting energy that we showed a couple slides ago as we move along the curve. And one thing that you can do, you can actually practice your variational calculus right here, because we're not going to do it in lecture, is that you end up with the following ODE determining your curve, that t prime is equal to omega times t, and u and v prime are omega cross product with u and v, respectively, where omega is the curvature binormal, or the curvature weighted binormal of our curve. Uh, omega is also called the Darboo vector of the curve. And even though the system of equations isn't terribly, uh, I don't know, intuitive, at least to me, essentially it satisfies some interesting no twist condition. What it's saying is that like, if I can just take u and v and drag them along my curve, like in the straight line case, then I should do that. And then if my curve has some curvature in it, well, now the tangent vector is changing and u and v have to start changing in response to that because they need to stay orthogonal to the tangent. But I want them to only twist in directions where they have to. So in particular, we never have that u twists in the v direction or vice versa, because that would kind of be extra motion that isn't needed. So now that we have a sort of canonical frame, notice that u and v don't depend on the physics, they're just a geometric frame along a curve. I can go back and write my material frame as some angle that's rotated off of the uv frame, which gives us yet another expression for the twisting energy, and also yet another way to express our physics. Because remember that our physics is essentially the geometry of the curve plus the twist of the material along the curve. And now I can think of the twist as just some angle which is displacing between u and v as shown on the slide here. So now we have all our degrees of freedom. Right? So if I want to simulate a floppy piece of spaghetti, well, what are all the things that have to move around? It's all the points along the curve of the spaghetti. It, that's the shape of the curve, and then the twisting angle theta, which is keeping track of how the material of the spaghetti is twisted along itself. 
So that's the basic setup of this nice, really elegant way to formulate the physics of a one-dimensional object like a string or a piece of spaghetti undergoing dynamics that involves both twist and stretch and bend. So now we just have to discretize it. Now I'm going to just quickly walk you through a little bit of how this paper chooses to discretize this problem, just to give you a flavor of what it takes. Um, I believe in our exercises we're considering having you implement part of this paper so you can really uh, feel the pain <laughs> uh, for yourself here. So here's going to be our basic setup. So this paper chooses to use lower indices for things positioned at vertices and upper indices for things positioned at edges. This doesn't really have to do with the Einstein notation that we developed a couple lectures ago. But instead, it's some kind of primal dual notation. It works OK. So the x's, for example, are the positions of the vertices of a polyline, which is what's going to discretize our piece of string, and the e's are the edge vectors, which are the differences between them. OK, so again, we can all agree on unit tangents. <laughs> right? The unit tangent is just e divided by its norm, because unambiguously, we can compute a tangent to our polyline curve and put it on all the edges here. But that's not enough. Remember, in order to compute these bending and, 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 and twisting energies, we need terms other than just the unit tangent. We need to compute like the curvature weighted binormal and a bunch of other ugly stuff. Now, I'm going to defer to the research paper here, but it turns out that a useful notion of curvature for this particular application, which comes from some of the definitions we've already made today, is yet another version of the turning angle curvature, where now, instead of either having, sorry, in this paper they use phi's instead of theta's, but same difference, instead of having phi i, or 2 sine of phi i over 2, in this paper, to preserve a different structure, you end up with 2 tangent of phi i over 2. Again, this is another expression that agrees to first order with all the other curvatures that we've already defined. Well, one reason to choose this kind of funny expression for curvature is because it's a very convenient expression for the curvature weighted binormal. So in this paper, we take the binormal to, again, just be this cross product, similarly to that uh, NMR paper that I was telling you about a little while ago. But if you weight it by this particular choice of kappa, you get a pretty elegant expression for the uh, Darboux vector, which is now a discrete Darboux vector located at each of the vertices. And that's the formula that I show you on the right. You can check that this thing has two properties. One is that it has a norm, which is the kappa i on the left-hand side. Arguing that, by the way, it requires quite a bit of trigonometry. <laughs> I tried on scrap paper and failed this morning. Uh, but in addition to that, um, it is orthogonal to the osculating plane, which is just a complicated way of saying, if I take the two line segments going into a vertex, those two things form a plane. And this curvature weighted binormal is orthogonal to that plane, which makes sense, because the binormal should be orthogonal to the plane spanned by kind of the local change in tangents. OK, so that's our way of getting a discrete Kirchhoff rod, which is what determines the dynamics here. We can also go back and um, compute all the different energies that I've mentioned for you before. Now, this is where the rubber kind of hits the road when it comes to the difference between discrete and discretized. What we end up seeing is that you can get a lot of nice, interesting, conserved structure in defining the curvature binormal the way that we did. But then defining the bending energy requires a little bit of discretization. In particular, you essentially have an integrated curvature binormal that you have to divide by the size of the dual cell. That's what you're seeing in the inside of the sum. And then you square it because you want the square norm. And then you have to scale and so on. So there's a little bit of discretization going on here. But it turns out for the physics, at least qualitatively, this seems to be good enough. Now, the last thing that we need in order to express those theta variables is some notion of the UV frame, or the discrete Bishop frame. And this research paper chooses to do that through a mechanism they call discrete parallel transport. We're going to see why in a couple lectures in this class. But the basic point here is that rather than defining u and v directly, remember that we did so by using an ordinary differential equation a couple slides ago. And you can do some discrete analog of that here. In particular, we can think of there being a matrix P, which takes the bishop frame along one edge and transports it to the bishop frame along another edge. Now, P is going to need a few properties. For one, it should take the unit tangent to the unit tangent. For another, it should leave the binormal alone. That's the second expression here. So in other words, the incoming and outgoing 
segments at a given vertex, well, both of these line segments form a plane. So if I take a ve vector perpendicular to that plane, then my discrete parallel transport operator is going to leave it alone. And then finally, it just leaves orthogonal vectors alone. So that's what gives us our third thing. And so essentially, this discrete parallel transport process is going to give us a way to take a UV frame on one edge of our polyline. So remember, I can complete our frame by adding the tangent and transport it to the next edge using sort of a minimalistic set of operations. So when we put all of these things together, well, now if we want to keep track of the twist of our physical system, it's just some angle theta attached to every edge of our polyline, which is telling us how much our, our twisted material is displaced from the least twisted frame, which is the bishop frame. This also gives us a nice twisting energy, which is just sort of the rate of change of theta along the curve. So once we have all of these energies and all these different variables, then from that point on, simulating the physics is basically just turning the crank and doing standard computational physics now that we have our degrees of freedom and you know, our energy function, like our Hamiltonian. And so in this class, since it's a geometry class, we're going to omit the physical dynamics, but it is definitely worth a read. And if you're feeling ambitious, you should implement this uh, method at home and see if you can simulate you know, a uh, twisted up uh, 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 shoelace or something like that. Now, if you like this kind of algorithm, uh, there's also a really fun follow-up paper that's worth a read, uh, which covers viscous threads. <laughs> so viscous threads are a different type of one-dimensional material that's similar to the elastic rods. But now, think like, you know, honey coming out of some container or, you know, pouring ketchup or what have you, um, where now there's a little bit of fluid motion and a little bit of solid motion going on. And one thing that you learn about if you read about viscous threads is just the cool physical dynamics that can happen here. So you can set up these examples, uh, these experiments with sort of a treadmill that's moving along at a constant speed. Um, you know, your instructor would personally rather use treadmills for this application than, you know, running. But in any event, you know, you, you, you have a treadmill going. Now you take a jar of honey and you pour it down on the treadmill. And as it falls onto the treadmill, it'll start to trace out a different pattern. Like if my treadmill is going super, super fast, basically the honey is just going to trace out a straight line. But if the treadmill is moving really slowly, then as shown in this figure here, the honey starts to kind of loop over itself, right? Because it's falling under its own weight and then has to collapse into a loop. And so actually, there's some really fun experiments in this paper where they show that their numerical model for these viscous threads kind of aligns with what is predicted in physics um, for this uh, fluid mechanical uh, uh, example. In fact, they say it's the first numerical fluid mechanical sewing machine. Apparently, that's the term for this treadmill with a bucket of honey falling on it. So for now, this is going to conclude our discussion of curves. Essentially, our, our moral of our story here is we saw three defi different definitions of integrated curvature on the dual cell associated to a vertex of a polyline. Now, all three of these expressions agree as theta goes to zero. So they're all kind of equally convergent, at least if we divide them by the, uh, the length of the dual cell. But in the discrete regime, they preserve three very different structures, right? So theta preserved the winding angle theorem. Two sine of theta over two was useful for the first variation of arc length, like we'll show in your homework. And then two tangent of theta over two uh, shows up in this physical experiment. So a single smooth quantity ends up to three different differential quantities, which I think is just so much fun to think about. Moreover, what we learned is that sometimes the objects that we really care about in theory aren't actually so useful in practice. So the Fernet frame is a fabulous example of that. Now, if you take an undergrad differential geometry class in the math department, you'll do all kinds of math involving the Fernet frame. And so it was sort of the most natural thing to try on discrete curves, but it turns out to be maybe not the best object to try and discretize. And then finally, a moral that you can take away from this discrete elastic rods work is just that sort of taking the proper degrees of freedom for a physical problem can go a long way. You end up with a really elegant formulation of this physical system. So in any event, uh, starting in our next lecture, we're going to dive into two-dimensional geometry. Now, you know, we're going to double the dimensions that we consider in 6838 from just curves. And now we're going to talk about surfaces, where the key applications are everywhere from computer graphics to computer vision. Essentially, the whole world around us is full of interesting surfaces. But for now, we'll 
conclude our uh, discussion of curves, and I will see you in our next lecture. Talk to you soon.